Um, we have reached the appointed hour and we have a quorum of commissioners. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order at uh, 533. Um, I'll read the standard opening statement. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 13th of June, 2024. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes a continuation of a notice intent for construction of three single family homes within the buffer zone on Landy Avenue, uh, a continuation for a notice of intent for construction of nine solar panel canopies within the riverfront of the Mill River, uh, this on uh, Mount Tom Road, uh, a continuation of a notice of intent for walkway deck and landscaping within the riverfront area, uh, this on Federal Street, um, and a request for determination of applicability to determine if removal of four trees within the riverfront is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance. Uh, this is by uh, the National Grid uh, uh, on Turkey Hill Road right of way. Uh, and then a, a notice of intent for wetlands replication related to driveway construction within bordering vegetated wetlands and buffer zone. Uh, this is on Coles Meadow Road. Um, so I'll go first. Uh, we have any um, minutes this time, um, but uh, I'll first ask if there's any general public comment that does not have to do with any of the topics before us this evening. Uh, Claudia Lefko. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Um, I hope <clears throat> Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I hope Sarah or Kevin or Carolyn has shared our email communications over the last few weeks concerning the border markings between 18 Montview Avenue and the Montview Conservation Area. I'm here to make comments on two concerns. It seems that there are no monuments on the property to mark the legal boundaries, or if there are boundaries, the staff in the city don't seem to know where they are and cannot locate them. I think borderlines must be the most basic, important, and necessary piece of information to have. What exactly is public property and what is private property? The city needs this for obvious legal reasons, and I feel there should be a visible indicator, a fence, or some kind of marker so the general public, as well as volunteers who are working on the conservation area, can cl be clear about what is what. And the second concern is there's a serious encroachment of private property overgrowth of shrubberies onto the public land. The residents at 18 Montview Ave, Jim and Dora, Jim Nash, Dora Lewis, whose property is bordered on three sides by the conservation area, could not tell me where their own property line marker was. And they didn't know, I mean, they didn't have any idea. And I finally got the map on my own from the place on Pleasant Street there, the registry of deeds or whatever it is. And I see on the map that on the east side of the property where there's a mowed playing field, the border is designated clearly by a utility pole and a guy wire. And I can see, I'm not an architect or an engineer, but there's there's a, there are towering, there's an encroachment into the into the playing field. There are towering overgrown shrubs around the pole and they're creeping into the mode area. It 20, maybe 25 feet, a line of bushes entwined with various vines that stretches some, I just pasted out, maybe it goes 80 feet back. So we're talking about a swath that's maybe 20 feet by 80 feet encroached onto the public land. When I wrote to Sarah about this and I sent photos, I received this message from Carolyn Mish. She said the city has absolutely no concerns about encroachment on the public land. I found this so shocking. I mean, this is conservation land and these are not conservation 
uh, plants. There are private plantings that are taking over a big swath of the conservation area. And then she went on to say, precise boundary is only critical if a proposed building or fence line construction is being considered. Nothing of the, or if there are, is clear encroachment by and butters. She said, if there's encroachment by and butters, then we should pay attention. But she says, nothing of the sort is happening there. And Kevin, you wrote me that when the question came up, it's standard practice to refer the inquiry or the request to the appropriate partner, which is MC3, which is the group that holds the conservation restriction and the management plan. But, um, you know, the general public, like I'm not the general public because I live across the street from this piece of property. So I know the property. But for the general public, if they were to be in the conservation area and see something untoward happening there, whatever it be, dogs running or unleashed or whatever, their first inclination would be call, I think, to call Sarah at the at her office or or Carolyn or notify you but they don't know how to get it they don't know who holds the conservation restriction on this so my concern was that nobody from the city or the conservation commission got in touch as far as I know with Jane Potter who is the president of the the conservation of MC3 so there's a breakdown in communication here like I'm just trying to say that there are things about the conservation that land that need to be protected and I'm asking you to kind of step up your your capacity to monitor this I'm asking you to respond to my con two concerns in this way. I wish you would, if you could, coordinate with MC3 and any other uh, conservation restriction holders in the city to create a protocol so that if somebody does call your office and say this is happening, something is happening illegally at Broadbrook or on Sheldon Field or in the Montview, that there would be a way for with someone responsible to call uh, the person in charge, the president of the board or whomever of the appropriate organization. Secondly, I would like the city to mark the border clearly between 18 Montview Avenue and the conservation area. This isn't something- oh, MC can, I, can I ask you, normally we restrict these to three or four minutes. So okay, I'm, I'm just gonna carry on a few seconds more um, to mark the- uh, MC3 cannot mark the property. That's something the city has to do. I find it shocking that the city and the CONSCOM are willing to cede this amount of property. It could be 1,600 square feet when open green space is such a pressing issue in the city and we're a very densely populated neighborhood. I don't see any purpose in letting this slide by, just like there are neighbors who want their dogs to run without leashes on this because they're neighbors, but uh, butters have no special rights with the conservation land. And I feel like it's gotten very messy because we don't haven't been enforcing this. And I'm not sure it's up to MC3 to enforce it. I think that somehow the city needs to make a clear marker. And finally, just to say there are houses all around this area. There are all sorts of abutters. And we just cannot afford to let anybody who's an abutter do whatever they want. It's where the ask here is a very simple thing, like just keep your your plantings on your property. And so I'm going to the board meeting of MC3, it's next week, and I'm going to ask them also to petition you, but I don't think it should take that. I feel like public land belongs to the public and we're all responsible. And it's to our benefit to have everybody caring about conservation and trying to enforce the, the appropriate laws. So I'm ending with that. I'm sorry if I've gone on a long time. This seems like such an easy issue. Our neighbor just came over the other day to say our hemlock tree is growing over his property fence and it's shading his plant. And so I feel terrible. I'll cut it. I mean, it seems like an easy ask to go to say to somebody, your, you know, your plantings are encroaching on the land. You need to cut them back, please. And that would be all there is to it. And that's all I'm asking. So I wish you would act on these two issues and I'm going to send you a copy of this so I because there's more in it and so thank you for listening to me and thank you for caring about conservation thank you
Any other public comments not having to do with the case before us this evening? If not, uh, first item is a notice of intent for construction of three single family homes at 39 Landy Avenue. Who's uh, here to present on that? I can ask for a couple minutes. Uh, from, um, uh, but, but, but Ryan from Rob Lebeck's office having a little computer issues right now. Uh, he, know... He's joining right now. Joining right now? Okay, good. While we're waiting, uh, we could dispose of the continuation, Sarah? Uh, yes, we could, um, but we would need to nail down a, the July meeting date first. I see. Uh, so that's, that works. we got to do, do uh, after the discussion about summer meeting schedule. Okay. okay. Um, got it. But I, I think he's here. Yes. Just hey, everyone. Now. Ryan Nelson yeah. from Lebeck Associates. Sorry to make you guys wait. <clears throat> Computer had to restart. All right, here. So I'm assuming we're getting right into it. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so last time we met, um, we had some concerns and debate back and forth about project being an improvement over existing conditions because there was work occurring within the 50 foot wetland buffer. And that was a performance standard of the local wetland ordinance in Northampton. Um, we've since submitted a revised plan. On that revised plan, we've shifted the proposed garage location so that they're outside the 50 foot buffer. We've moved the um, roof uh, stormwater outfalls and the drains outside the 50 foot buffer as well. So those would daylight on grade um, just outside the 50 foot and we've increased the mitigation plantings and proposed trees um, to not only within that inner 35 foot buffer but also the 50 foot as well so we've increased the mitigation area that square footage is now um, 5,531 square feet approximately um, and we've reduced our obviously our total wetland buffer zone disturbance and it is now 10,495 square feet um, no other real changes same footprints for the houses and the garage just tightened up those locations and trying to give the biggest buffer between the wetland and the proposed development to help alleviate the concerns of um, stormwater and absorption and plant uptake. So we think we've addressed those concerns. Questions, comments uh, by commissioners? I'm being really concerned, this is Paul, uh, concerned about um, high flow of groundwater into those uh, basements and the added pressure on the sump pumps to discharge into the uh, protected area. So that what's proposed is consistent with most of the other houses on the street. Um, the existing house that was on the property had a full basement. So this is really nothing different than all of the residencies and development in, in this neighborhood. My understanding is the basins will be approximately 96 inches deep and the water table is 44 inches below the surface. Uh, the seasonal high, correct. Yeah. Hmm. And as uh, 
Florida is discovering this week, um, that's not going to get better over time. <laughs> One of the uh, concerns I expressed uh, last time um, was that we are looking right now at a, uh, a lot that has been previously uh, disturbed, but has, other than uh, some debris left over uh, from where there was pavement or garage, uh, that it's essentially all uh, pervious surface and that you're you know, adding to uh, an empty lot all of these houses, garages, walkways, driveways, um, and that's a, a huge increase in impervious surface adjacent to um, a, uh, a protected area um, and within a topography that's uh, not down gradient of that um, protected area. Uh, it's essentially a flat area. Uh, so my my question, and I, I, I said it in the last hearing, that I think there's just too much impervious service. That, uh, I un understand that you're trying to um, build homes, and I think building homes is a fine thing. Um, but I would feel much more comfortable if there were less of them on this lot. Um, and I understand that that's just uh, a uh, uh, an opinion. If you're pulling it out of the, the area over which we have uh, to require a substantial improvement, um, we may not have the leverage to say, here's what you got to do. I think we can probably say um, that you would have to do slab foundations rather than full foundations. Um, Great. May I ask a question here? Getting back to this, you said it's going to be 96 inches, which would be an eight-foot foundation. And that's, is that, Paul, how you got the, the number from? Yes. Okay. And, Ryan, the water table is at what depth? Uh, approximately 44 inches down. Okay. Now, we leave the house approximately 36 inches above the ground. You subtract the two, you got 60 inches. Now you subtract the 44 inches, you have 16 inches going into the water table. So, I mean, it's it's wrong when you say it's going to be 96 inches. It won't be 96 inches. Oh. Uh, so the thing is, it's going to be 16 inches into the water table, not 96 inches. Okay. So I don't see how 16 inches in the water table, which may be there, may not be there. We don't know. If that's just the, the highest possible point, is going to affect everything over there and that's it's it's not adding up to me so i'd, I'd also like to um address the, the chairman's comment um i understand the concern for impervious however if we weren't to develop the buffer zone at all uh it would render this property essentially useless there, there's not enough room between the 100 foot buffer and the front setback to really do anything meaningful um so that obviously that's why we're here tonight. We're asking for permission for work in the buffer zone. And the hope uh, goal or the intent of the protection is to protect the wetlands. So that's why we're leaving that 50 foot strip so that it can act under its natural qualities to uh, buffer and to infiltrate and to treat the water quality before entering the wetland. Um, having a general concern over impervious on the remainder of the site with portions outside the buffer zone. Um, I mean, that you could make that argument for the whole entire neighborhood, but the- I agree, I think it's- uh, is We're protecting the, uh, the treatment channel from our project site to the wet. If, if the uh, rules we have today were in place uh, and this had been an undeveloped neighborhood, I think it would be very difficult to develop it. So I think you're you're right about that. Uh, this was all put in place before our current, uh, uh, both local statute and state uh, law were in place. I, I agree. So we're proposing a modest size houses in fairly small garages within the outer 50 foot buffer zone 
we're providing a 50 foot strip of treatment. Um, I, I'd like to hear an argument otherwise, how this is harmful to the wetland. And if you don't mind, I'd, I think the amount of houses is irrelevant. It's the size of the foundations, the size of the units. So you could have two houses there that are, could be each twice the size of this and you end up with more square, square footage used on the property. So, I mean, I know there, there's a lot of people in the neighborhood just don't want the houses and they're using the Conservation Commission as a way to try to prevent it. And uh, that's their their game. Um, but the thing is, it's not the amount of houses, it's the amount, and like Ryan said, we've been, these houses are extremely small footprints. And like I just said, we'll be 16 inches into the, what the high water table will be. We've done, and we've done everything power, you know, in our power to go with the Conservation Commission. Anything you wanted, we said yes to. So it's not like we've been trying to fight or argue with anybody. We've just been trying to work. I can't, uh, I can't be certain of uh, your intent. I can only see uh, that when you first came to us, it was uh, intruding on uh, the protected area, um, that at every turn, it seems like if you've made an accommodation for uh, wetlands requirements, it's been at our insistence, not because you're acting responsibly toward the environment. Um, and I, I so, like I said, I can't assess your intent, but the, uh, the fact that uh, we've had to draw those lines and, and make those uh, requirements um, indicates that uh, you're trying to maximize uh, whatever you can get out of this lot. Um, and that is perhaps that. understandable, but, but that's, uh, that's also, uh, you described it as a game for the neighbors to try and uh, limit what can be done in their neighborhood. Um, and there's a game about, uh, all right, how much can I do? What can I uh, exploit from a given piece of land? Um, so everybody is trying to trying to pull uh, things in their preferred direction, um, and I we we are in the position of saying, well, um, we we have a responsibility to protect the wetland, and strictly speaking, on the basis of the rules, uh, by pulling it away from fifty feet, so you're not actually, uh, other than doing some plantings, you're not actually doing anything within the fifty foot zone. Uh, that reduces our ability to uh, to say uh, no, you can't. Um, I, th I think we will have some ability to require slab foundations, but um, uh, it's a. Uh, this seems, you know, I guess my my recommendation last time, my question last time was. Um, would you be willing to have fewer houses? Would you be willing to have two instead of three? Would you reduce the impervious area um, um, by a substantial amount um, so they're not actually maximizing the exploitation of this land? Um, given the rules, we may not be able to stop it, but uh, it feels like an exploitation to me. So the previous use or the, the pre-demolition, this was mostly maintained grass lawn right up to that rear property line nearest the wetland. Um, and when we do our hydrocat analysis, just for other projects, not for this one, but maintained grass has a high sh sheet flow coefficient similar to pavement. Um, so I would not say that this is an exploitment of... Um, I understand, but we're looking at the situation that's there now where there's no buildings. Correct, but it's grass right now. We're proposing to convert all of this maintained, formerly maintained grass area into Please. an area which will uh, increase infiltration and decreases the sheet flow coefficient to the wetland, which is your concern of stormwater runoff from those outlets. Yeah, so I see you have, have a question. Have less lawn space technically than what was prior. Jen, do you have your hand up? Yeah, sorry. Um, I The one thing I just did want to note is I do, I hear the comment that 
multiple houses are irrelevant and it's more the square footage but i do think the like having three garages and three paved driveways like proportional like that just greatly increases the impervious surface so um but how is, how do you know that will have an impact on the wetlands that's really what you're determining if whether it's six houses or two houses you're just making a subjective opinion on what you think is too much. I would like to know how that adversely impacts the wetlands, please. I also have a question, which is, do you have plans for, or can you plan for a permanent boundary marking of that 50 foot buffer so that the planting that is behind it, protecting the wetland is a no disturb zone? Absolutely, yep. We're open to that. That can certainly be conditioned. Absolutely. It also seems like the, you know, part of this, it depends on the quality of sort of the plantings and the restoration and what gets established in the wetland side. Mm -hmm. um, do you have thoughts about managing invasive species back there or coming up with a plan to make sure that those plantings survive? Yes. Um, so we're happy to accommodate um, maybe a condition of monitoring, whether it's a year, two years, three years, wherever the commission feels is sufficient. And that can include um, yearly or biannual um, invasive plant species monitoring and removal. So that was something we anticipate as a possible condition. Other questions, comments from commissioners? Are, are we satis satisfied that the snow removal, say in a, a heavy snowfall winter, is going to be sufficient um, to protect the wetlands? I mean, where does that snow go, especially for the, the third unit at the top of the design? Um, it would be snow blowed either to the backyard or the front yard in front of the porch. Okay. So that's not going to increase pressure as it melts on the wetlands. Uh, I mean, moving the snow 30 feet across the yard, I, I don't see how that's going to impact the wetlands. Okay. Sorry, I'm having trouble zooming in on the plan. Can, can you point out the rain gardens? I just lost those on this version. Yep. So we don't have any rain gardens uh, proposed in the rear anymore because that would be site grading within the 50 foot. Okay. So no rain gardens. And are those three small gray boxes, the sump pump, proposed sump pump outages? Correct. These are the invert outlets. One right here for lot one, lot two, and then lot three right here. And you don't have any estimates still on the flow, the expected or anticipated flow from those at different parts of the season? No, that's very variable dependent upon rainfall and a bunch of other factors. Um, if anyone has seen a foundation drain, it's a steady trickle. It's never a gushing uh, outflow kind of like a, a gutter would be. Um, it's usually a steady trickle. Hmm. And what do you say about uh, switching from full basement to slab? John, do you have a comment on that? That's not advantageous. I mean, I'm to have all three of them with slabs doesn't when you're going to be at, at most sixteen inches into what. Is considered the wet, wet area or whatever the object. How would you describe that, Ryan? The seasonal high groundwater. Seasonal high groundwater, which may not even get there. And I built the house right across the street, and there was not an issue whatsoever with any water. So, is that a yes or a no? I prefer not to know. I would prefer not to.
Other questions, comments from commissioners? Questions or comments uh, from members of the public? I see a hand up for Jackie. Yes, th thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. I have three points to make based on my own experience and, and my heart is pounding. I have to take a breath. Um, Ryan talked about- Can this you stay your, stay, can you state oh, your address, please? Jackie Balance from 35 Warner Street in Bay State Village. Thank you for reminding me. Um, this I live in Bay State Village, which is basically a drumlin surrounded by water, by the Mill River, by Broughton's Creek, by these wetlands. And we've been doing some citizen science mapping out underground waters in this general area that have not been recognized before as wetlands. Um, I'm going off the subject. Ryan talked about this plot being uh, planted in grass. Planted in grass ignores the fact that a, a orchard of fruit trees were cut down a, ten, a thousand years worth of Norway spruce growth was cut down and all of these and 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 assorted shrubs and flowering plants used to grow here there were roots here there wasn't grass now quadruple nearly quadrupling the impervious surface over the previous house um is going to have an impact because i live downhill from a similar development where a single family house was demolished, the trees cleared, three houses and garages built. And since that time, we have noticed, I have just a half a block downhill, we have noticed increased erosion, increased flooding. And this, this property flows through the wetlands, basically across Riverside Drive and into the Mill River. And there's a someone who lives on the downflow side of this property says that when she bought the house 10 years ago, there was a hurricane came through and her basement flooded. Her neighbors told her that basement had never flooded in anybody's memory. Now, her basement has flooded five times in the past year and the sump pump has to have a backup system because it gets so wet. That's what happens when you increase impervious surface. That's my own direct experience in this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from members of the public? I see uh, Jacqueline. Hi, yes. Um, I'm really interested in learning about what the dewatering process is like for a site like this, and then also how you do keep lawn chemicals and herbicides and de-icing agents um, and whatever else, you know, if the, if the um, people are pushing the snow into their backyards up to the buffer zone, um, how you keep those clean uh, with all those chemicals. So my questions are about dewatering, the dewatering process during construction, and then how do you keep um, those chemicals that could be used on the properties out of the wetlands and out of the Mill River? Thanks. Sure, so Thank dewatering you. during construction um, is I think different than the ongoing lawn treatments or something that you may be referring to. So during construction, let's say when they're digging the foundation for the house, groundwater is encountered, making the work conditions wet. Uh, they would dig either a, a trench around it to divert the water to a pool, or they would pump it out to a temporary pool on site, preferably outside the buffer zone, uh, but still within the limit of work. Um, and that, you know, temporarily shoveling against the tide, so to speak, 
to keep the work site dry until they finish the foundation work or whatever they need to do. They install the drains around it and then backfill and then the dewatering uh, pool and the pumps are no longer needed. Um, once the site's constructed, there really is no dewatering going on aside from uh, the foundation drain and the sump pumps uh, actively working. And the, uh, uh, the restrictions on the use of fertilizer and chemicals uh, are sometimes things that the commission requires uh, mm -hmm. as a condition uh, to go with a permit. Uh, and then that is with the deed in perpetuity. So uh, the enforcement is, uh, is a problem, but uh, the requirement can be made. Uh, that no salt uh, to the wetland of anything that might be harmful to the wetland. Um, I see Joe M. Oh, but can I ask one quick question, Kevin, and then I'll be done to tack on to the rest of my other two questions? Yes, go ahead, Jackie. Um, the question, thank you so much. Um, with the imperv impervious surface area, how does that affect the ability of the land, like to deal with recharge properly. And um, I, I, I don't know. Sorry, I, I couldn't, how does that affect what? How does imperfect surface area affect the land's ability to deal with recharge? So you're limiting the surface area at which the water interfaces with the ground. So uh, let's say for the house example, it hits the roof, the shingles, it goes to the gutters and then um, it discharges on the lawn area somewhere. Um, it's still infiltrating within the same general vicinity. Um, you're, you know, 30, 40 feet away from the house as opposed to in place if the house wasn't there. Um, you get a little more like spot intensity of infiltration. Sometimes it causes the ground to get a little saturated. Um, but generally we're infiltrating everything on site and that's um, also, part of the purpose of that vegetated buffer zone that we're proposing to plant and leave to restore back to or revert back to natural forest is that we'll have a higher infiltration rate than the surrounding lawn areas. I see. Thank you. I see Reese. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yes. Sorry. Reese? Hi, uh, this is Joe M. I was, uh, had raised my hand when Jacqueline asked the last question. Uh, I'm Joe Marabello. I live on 14 Landy Avenue. And I was a little late to the meeting, so this may have already been discussed. But on your proposed sub pump line, where does it actually dump the water? Right here. There's one. There's another one. Here's the third. Well, it dumps the water right there in the ground. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Can uh, Can you describe uh, uh, how that will avoid how you intend to avoid uh, channeling or erosion at those points of discharge? Sure. So um, it's typical that these outlets would be what we call the flared end section. So at the end of the pipe, there's kind of a, a flared. Uh, opening that's either plastic and then it gets armored with riprap stone and then everything is seeded down gradient of that. So the stone and the flared end help dissipate the velocity and energy of the water, which we don't anticipate to be very strong, seeing as it's groundwater driven, um, potentially. During storm events with the roof leader runoff, that would be a different story. That would come out with a little more force but once again um, this is typical uh, construction best management practices for those outfalls quick question uh let's say we had five inches of rain um is there any way to quantify the amount of sump pump discharge and would it overwhelm that uh, receiving area um for a, from a groundwater standpoint, I don't know if we'd be able to 
calculate that without assuming a lot of variables like uh, soil infiltration rates and how fast the water moves through a soil. Um, mm -hmm. We could calculate that from the from the roofs. That's no problem. That's just a static volume. Yeah. Um, so if you had, you know, five inches, that's like 0. 0.41 feet times 900 square feet, 375, that's 375 cubic feet of water. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what that means to you, but that would be the volume of rainwater coming off the roof under, under a five inch rain event. Yeah. But that's static too. That's not happening all at once. That's over whatever the duration of that rain event is. Thank you. Um, and I called before on Reese Epic. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can Kevin? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Apologies. Uh, I'm having some technical issues. My name is Reese Epic. I live at Thirty Land EF. So I'm across from the proposed development. Um, I just want to throw in a couple of uh, pieces of information. Someone mentioned that uh, whatever's being installed is similar to what's currently there. I can't speak for my neighbors, but I can tell you when we did a renovation several years ago, we put in a, both a perimeter drain as well as a sump pump. And I don't know the technical term, but we have a pipe that you know, pushes the water out from the sump pump. And it's not a trickle. It actually is a fairly a gush. So it, it, it's not just a trickle. Um, I think there was a, some confusion, and I believe uh, one of the other commenters mentioned this, but when, when Franny and Tony owned the property, the previous owners, it wasn't mostly grass. It was actually mostly an orchard and a garden which is not at all the same thing as just a lawn. Uh, so I think some of these facts need to be kind of clarified and corrected. Um, and then I think, uh, John, when you built Abdul's house, and I could be wrong please, on this. Please address apologies. your comments. Please address your comments to the commission and uh, not to uh, uh, the applicant. Oh, my apologies. Um, in terms of how far deep the basement goes, there was a reference to a previous house built on this uh, on the street uh, without a basement problem. My understanding is that, the, and I could be wrong, but the house was actually supposed to be deeper, but they hit a rock or something. So they couldn't go as deep as the foundation as they were supposed to. So I'm not sure it's an equivalent. Uh, it Maybe it is, but I don't believe it's an equivalent comparison on that uh, as well. And I also just had a clarifying question is the patio can't tell if that's new because I missed the last meeting or not, but is that considered a perv impervious um, surface as well? Uh, that, it's a, uh, a question of whether the uh, paver patio um, was included in your impervious surface calculation. That's or correct. Those, they were, they were included. Impervious pavers. Impervious pavers were included in the calculation. Thank you. Um, I see Celeste. Hi there, Celeste Palladino, 29 Landy Ave. Um, I guess I wanted to quickly echo uh, Reese's comments, just at least speaking of this past summer uh, with the, the intense rainfall event, the sump pump out, output was definitely, you know, 24 7, 3 a.m. You know, it would be going so loudly that we would be woken up. Um, definitely a stream down the road. Um, so, not a trickle. Um, and then I say this honestly, not playing any games, not trying to block anything or use the Conservation Commission, more out of concern for future neighbors who I look forward to meeting. Uh, you know, but I think I have a shed that is probably situated where the garage would be. And again, this past summer, the water was so high that it flooded. It's all warped now. Uh, you know, my basement flooded as well when the sump pump went out. So just, you know, just noting concerns for, for future residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, I see two hands of people who have already spoken. Uh, is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet? Melissa. 
Uh, yes, Melissa Curtin at 20 Bridge Road in Florence. I just was uh, interested in a point of clarification for my own understanding. Um, I thought I had read in the materials that the uh, water table uh, evaluation was done in January. Is that correct? Um, I don't recall. Uh, uh, Ryan, do you remember? Or Sarah? Uh, I, I believe that it may have been, but estimated seasonal high groundwater um, does not need to have the, the water level present. It's based on indicators and soil types. That's correct. And uh, it was done middle of winter, either January or March. I'd have to go back and look at the logs. But in either case, um, weeping or actual visible groundwater is usually at its highest during that time of the year or near it. So it's definitely um, an optimal time to do test pits if you're looking for, looking for that. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, is there anyone else who has not spoken? Who wishes to? Um, may I clarify I, uh, something though? Excuse me, Mike. May I clarify something? Sure. Uh, what Reese was talking about when he says the sump pump goes off was different from what Ryan was talking about when he said a trickle. What Ryan was talking about was the drainage around the footing. And he wasn't talking about, you know, the sump pump. Yeah, the, the sump pump goes off. There is, you know, it's under pressure. It's a pump. So it's a two, two different things. So, and that's the difference. So I don't think Ryan, you know, I think people heard it the incorrect way. Thank you. Uh, uh, we usually allow people to speak once, um, but uh, I will at this point ask Jackie if there's something uh, to add that uh, hasn't been addressed yet. Yes, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I forgot one thing. I know the, the whole stormwater issue in light of climate change is really top priority. I also want to say a word, habitat. This is habitat for a lot of wildlife. We we treasure our small herd of deer, even even our bobcats, and habitat and wildlife is part of your purview. Thank you. Thank you. And Jacqueline. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate what the developer is trying to do to provide homes um, for people who do want to live in Northampton because we have such an amazing city here. Um, I think that I, I am hoping that developers can start to look to purchase land um, that's higher and drier. And in these situations where they're very low and wet and near sensitive habitat and waterways and wetlands, that the impervious surface area just really is vastly reduced. Because um, I know, I, I do believe you're do doing good in trying to provide homes for people. Um, but I too am concerned about newcomers and what they're getting themselves into. And I'm concerned about our, our wetlands and our waterways and our significant trees. And um, it is a, del a delicate balancing act. Um, and I just, I hope the city and developers begin to take climate change really into consideration um, in terms of balancing those priorities, including our safety, our, our flood control, our heat mitigation, with also providing housing for, for newcomers. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, um, is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And a second? Second. Hi, right, Jen. Uh, all in favor, roll call, Sarah. Roll call vote, Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. So as, uh, as the applicant has, just to 
to state my uh, thinking about this. When it was still a project proposed under the jurisdiction of the city ordinance, and we uh, are therefore empowered to require uh, significant improvement over the present condition. Uh, then I uh, was more inclined to uh, find ways uh, to require a genuine and substantial improvement. Uh, now that it's outside the 50 foot zone, um, that essentially removes, and correct me, Sarah, if I'm overstating this, but it, that essentially removes um, our judgment about whether um, we think this uh, plan is represents an improvement over prior conditions. Um, still, um, uh, is, it seems to me, as I've said, like too much. Um, I'm not sure that we have a basis for saying no, but it does seem to me like it's too much. Um, and I'll I'll say for uh, if, if for anybody on the call, um, when the city passed its ordinance, and that was maybe 20 years ago or so, uh, it was just before I joined the commission, so I was not party to those discussions. Um, the idea of encouraging infill was built into the plan that uh, uh, instead of spreading things out all over the more rural areas um, to take existing developed areas and uh, making them more densely populated uh, was thought to be a beneficial thing. That the way it was written though didn't distinguish between, uh, I mean, it, it, urban residential uh, B and C, it talked about uh, business <laughs> zoning, it talked about the different zones, but it didn't, uh, didn't in that language also introduce any consideration about whether in fact um, some of these infill areas were more vulnerable um, environmentally than others. Uh, had, and that would give us something else to work with. But at this point, my own sense is that uh, uh, we, 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 we can try and require um, certain things. I think we should try to require a slab basement um, rather than full basement. And if the uh, applicant uh, stated that uh, that's a no-go, then um, then we, I don't, I, I, anyway, I wanted to say how I'm thinking about this and I'm interested in how the other commissioners are thinking about this. Kevin, I- and Members of the public probably know, we, we can't discuss this outside of these kind of public hearings. So I'm not sure how anybody is thinking. Well, I like the idea of slab basements and two units of the same existing size rather than three. However, I think that the proposal meets our narrowly defined criteria. And I think that uh, it may not take into consideration um, the legitimate concerns of the neighbors. And it is a move towards infill, which is good. Um, but I do think that it's a not a great piece of property to be doing this on, but that the the letter of the regulations is being met. And so I would have a hard time opposing it. Uh, but having some conditions, for example, I want to make sure that the trees in the buffer zone are uh, species wise, uh, like willow trees, maximally absorbent of water. Uh, I think there are certain conditions that we can we can easily attach to this. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Paul. Other people? I I that? also I, I think to me the the important conditions to add would be around making sure that those plantings are successful and we get good um, sort of restoration of that area in terms of invasive species management and also that what's proposed actually survives. Yes. Um, because from my perspective, I think getting plantings of that over that area does does seem to meet the requirements and would be an improvement. And I agree with all 
every of the three above statements. I don't think I have anything specific to add, but I agreed with everything that my other three fellow commissioners said. Um, so let's uh, uh, make a, a motion to grant a permit um, and a second, and then we can have a more detailed discussion about what conditions we want to require. Is there a motion to grant a permit? I'll make I a move. motion. Oh. And I'll second it. All right, made and seconded. Um, Sarah, roll call, all okay. in favor? Roll call to, for issuance of an order. Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Hmm. Um, I think that uh, uh, the that, that uh, it would be, well, we'll see what everybody else thinks, but I, I think it would be um, good to have as a condition that it be a slab foundation, first of all, um, on all three properties and the garages, um, that uh, there be a uh, permanent set of either bollards or uh, boulders demarcating the 50 foot zone so that future owners um, don't just mow further um, over the years. Um, that uh, there should be a, a, a condition that um, a management plan uh, be developed uh, by the developer uh, to uh, assure that the new plantings survive for multiple growing seasons and mm -hmm. that uh, uh, no uh, uh, fertilizers or other uh, chemicals uh, wash into the uh, uh, the protected zone, the, 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 the wetland itself. Um, so those are the ones that come to mind for me. Uh, why I say a management plan is because um, in practical terms, part of why we've ended up in the past having bollards or boulders um, is because merely having a, a demarcated line um, is usually not enough. Um, people just say, oh, that, you know, the, let's, let's mow a little further next year. And so uh, being able to have a, a firmly demarcated uh, permanent uh, line, I think is necessary. And in, the, uh, in a similar way, having a, a, a rule or a condition that attaches to the deed that says no uh, fertilizers or other chemicals should be, or salt uh, should, will be allowed to flow into the wetland, um, that requires some kind of management plan. Um, that, uh, and I, I'm not going to describe what that is, but it should be a plan that is acceptable um, to, uh, to the commission, to, to Sarah. Um, any other uh, conditions that people want to add? Those, are the, and I'm not asserting that those have to be. Those. I'm saying those are the ones that uh, seem uh, important to me. Well, you know, Kevin, I I hold my nose to play devil's advocate here, but um, how does going to slab basements actually lead to a significant improvement of the property? Is that because the basements constitute an unacceptable risk of flooding into the wetlands? Um, my my sense is that the farther, and I'm basing this in part on some uh, some pumps that I've known and loved over the years, um, ah. that the, uh, uh, the 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 deeper the water source, uh, the larger the section of the year where there's actually water to be pumped out and. I'm imagining, uh, and I've uh, seen this in other locations, that this would be pretty close to a, if it's a full basement in this land where when we walked the land, we could see the standing water not far off the uh, western edge there. Um, and so I'm, I'm imagining that if there's a, a, a seven or eight foot deep uh, uh, sump that's uh, pumping uh, water, it's going to be probably most of the time, most of the year. Um, and so a, a slab um, would not be as deep. 
is my thinking. Do you think that um, channeling is being properly abated with those uh, flared receptacles and riprap? Hard to tell. Um, the, it is part of my thinking that the, the less water going in, the more likely they'll be adequate. Um, the, the more water, which I assume um, uh, will come from a deeper foundation, uh, I'm not yeah. so sure. I mean, the hypothetical here is what happens to five or, in the event of a five or six inch rainfall, which is not at all out of the question. It's going to happen with increasing frequency. And that's a hypothetical. It's really hard to, to see what the impact would be on the wetlands. I agree. Um, I, I, uh, I wish we had uh, in the ordinance additional tools um, to, to limit this yeah. project. I, I don't think we do. That's my problem. I don't think we do. I don't I, think we do. I have to vote in favor of this and hold my nose with the existing plan with the modifications that you've talked about minus the slab. I think the banks that people are getting mortgages from would want to ask how safe are these foundations from repeated flooding before they issue a mortgage. But I think uh, it's not in our jurisdiction to protect the consumers. Yeah, no, I, I was uh, inclined toward a slab because I thought it would reduce the uh, uh, the sump output. Yeah. Yep. Other conditions by anybody? Or and and, and Paul was questioning slab versus full basement. Uh, I'm, uh, open to further discussion about that as well. The the other condition that I think we should do is the erosion control. Yes. And you said a maintenance plan, but I think I would also like a planting plan in advance of the installation, which I know is on here, I guess, but just to the specific. There's a list, there's a list of intended plants um, and how many of them and what size. So maybe that is, yeah. Uh, that it would just be a part of the uh, condition that the, for multiple growing seasons, usually we require three, yeah. sometimes five, but usually three, uh, that at least 75% of the initial planting survives and is flourishing. Um, and if not, it's got to get replanted. We need to restate uh, the uh, conditions. Uh, did the did the commission want to prohibit commercial um, pesticides and fertilizers within the buffer zone? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of places that do organic fertilization that are just fine. Any other conditions anybody wants to suggest? What What's the final decision by the commission on the, the slab? Right. I'm, I'm inclined to require the slab um, and, um, but uh, that's, if, if, if uh, you know, Paul raises a legitimate concern, we don't really know and we don't have a quantified projection of what the output is going to be. Um, so in some ways, uh, I'm, I'm asserting that preference on the basis of, well, it seems logical that there'd be less um, volume coming out if uh, it's a shallower, if it's just a slab sitting on the top rather than going down seven or eight feet into the groundwater. Um, well, he, he said 16 inches. <laughs> right? Yeah. What I said was, I don't take me out of context, please. What I said was, you stated that it's going to be eight feet, 96 inches in the ground. The foundation will be sticking up around 36 inches, which leaves 60 inches. But the water table is 44 inches below that, which leaves 16. It's that's that's what I stated. Right. That's what I was understanding. 
Okay, so if there's something funny about that, let me know. But it's just simple math. Got it. I'm not okay. sure if I'm allowed to speak, but I just want to clarify that the discussion that occurred prior to the commission making a motion to close the hearing and vote to approve, uh, it was explicitly stated these would be full basements. I've never encountered the situation where the commission's made a condition with a construction change that large after the hearing closed. So uh, John and I also question the commission's authority in that type of condition in regards to a foundation basement versus a slab. Yeah. And the commission does have the ability to impose conditions. Closing the hearing means that they have sufficient information to be able to reach their decision. Yep, I understand, but I've never seen a condition change a building ever in the thousand NYs I've done. Never. So, um, uh, I, I understood the applicant to say uh, the preference was for a full basement. Um, is the applicant's position th that no, no, that's what we're going to do, so that that's what we would have to be voting on? It's not just a preference, but a firm position. You've I already made the vote. Pardon me? You've already made the vote. Well, we voted to close the hearing. We haven't voted on the uh, uh, permit itself yet. So you, you voted uh, to issue the order, and now we're working on conditions. I, I would assert that it, it is within the, the commission's ability to uh, add additional conditions to protect the um, the interests of the Wildlife Protection Act, whatever those may be. Okay, that that's fine. I just wanted to state my, my opinion. <laughs> So again, the clarifying uh, question for me is, uh, is it the applicant's position that this has to be a full basement? It's... Because if we uh, want to put that in as a condition um, that it won't be adhered to, uh, then it's a different kind of problem. But uh, I had understood a preference was the answer, not uh, firm, um, though we've got to have full basements. We would, we would like full basements. Um, the commission already voted on the meeting so if they feel that's a necessary condition we really have no no say over that at this point point. and that would change the size of the size of the foundation too pardon me change the size of the foundation i mean you just can't say okay you can't put a found you know you have a plan but a house with the foundation underneath it you just can't state well you know change it so it's no foundation now you have to go out and get new plans which is a hardship and the, the, the new plans may be different size than this. So it's, I don't think you understand. You just can't say, well, the house you're gonna build, well, don't, just don't put a foundation under it. It was designed that way. And it it creates a whole nother, whether, no, it just creates a whole nother, another meeting where the, the foundation be changed, everything else. And I don't think any of you have built a house and you don't understand that, but it's, it's, <laughs> The basement elevation isn't shown on these plans. It's indicated to be the finished floor elevation, but it, it wasn't specific about the basement. That's correct. We don't have a basement floor elevation stated. So that that's not a, that would not actually be a, a change from the, the plans that were submitted. It's it would just be. Is the commission specifying one thing versus the other? We talked about it for four meetings, but okay. Well, I've put it. We, we have not voted on the permit and associated conditions yet. 
um, the order of conditions and, and what those conditions would be. Uh, and I have proposed that it be uh, a slab, a basement be a requirement, um, be a condition um, rather than a full basement. And um, I, I'm, if, if the rest of the commission is um, okay with adopting that condition, um, then that's what we would be voting on along with the other conditions that we've just talked about. Um, but if that is unacceptable to the applicant, that'd be useful to know at this point so we know what we're voting on. If that's the only thing the commission is likely to allow, then it may be possible we'd be coming back in the future with an amendment to alter the footprint sizes with the new house plans. Well, like I said before, a lot of this is judgment because we don't have uh, quantified estimates of uh, the likely flow. And so I'm just going with the intuitive logic that says if it's a shallower um, source, it's likely to be less groundwater. Um, and that was the basis of my su suggestion that we include this as a condition. Um, and I understand uh, that uh, that may impose some hardship um, in terms of having to modify the designs. Um, I understand. Um, but I think uh, that's what uh, I'm proposing. Um, and although there's been some discussion, we haven't agreed as a commission yet that that will be one of the conditions. That's just the ones that I propose and we've talked about. Well, I think that you have to understand you can't just do a slab house with the dimensions that are here. You don't just say chop the foundation out when the whole plans have been done. How big a change does that represent for you as a builder? Well, it means a whole new set of plans. Um, it could get a little bit wider. 900 square feet of livable space. It's half of your livable space. Well, since this uh, seems to be um, an area of concern, let me first pull the rest of the commissioners and say, am I the only one who feels like this is uh, uh, a logically important thing to require? And, and if not, if, if people don't feel similarly, then you know I'm okay with uh, removing that condition. But uh, I'm interested to hear from the rest of the commission. Kevin, I would I would remove that condition. Um, let the plans go forward uh, as proposed with stipulations we require, um, and um, but to allow the uh, full basements to be built. Do you want to frame that as a motion, Paul? Well, I, you mean to move that we remove that suggestion. I just, just to uh, if, if the commission's uh, finished discussing the the rest of the conditions, um, to, yeah, to, to, to issue, to, will we already issue the order to uh, include the conditions discussed um, and absent the requirement for slab on grade? Move that we accept the conditions that were discussed minus the suggestion or mandate that the uh, <clears throat> basements be converted to slabs. Is there a second? Yeah, I can I'll second that. That's with the second. Um, made and seconded any further discussion. So this is a motion to 
grant an order of conditions with the conditions we've discussed uh, minus the requirement that it be a slab foundation. Yeah. All in favor? Oh, Paul. Uh, Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Not happily, but yes. <laughs> All right, um, that was longer than planned, but now um, we have uh, a notice of intent for a walkway deck and landscaping within the riverfront area, uh, this uh, 60 Federal Street. Who's here to present on that? There, that's me, can you hear me? That it, yeah, yes, people from folks can hear. Yes. Yeah, okay, I'm going to try to turn up my volume a you're, little bit. You're, you're a bit quiet, thing. but we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Elena from Regenerative Design Group. We're working on a landscape plan for 60 Federal Street. Um, I can share my screen here. This is the existing conditions of the lot. Um, it's right against the Mill River and also the corner of Broughton's Brook where that meets with the, the Mill River. Um, at the moment, there is a uh, two-story residence and a single-story studio converted garage, um, an existing deck and existing stonework, as well as um, existing driveway and a uh, walkway area that is planned to be removed. Um, the proposed plan includes um, a slight addition of a walkway along the driveway, a uh, low wall that borders the front yard area, again, the removal of that walkway that exists here, and a slight expansion of the um, wooden deck at the backyard. Um, this also includes a significant increase in uh, planned um, planted areas, a conversion from lawn space to, to um, native plantings, um, removing three dying apple trees that we believe are um, too wet, the conditions are too wet for those to survive. So replacing that with a river birch and several uh, service berry trees along the, the front and side yard, uh, along with all removing some invasives along the side yard, but particularly uh, not read at the riverbank of the Mill River in Broughton's Brook. Um, there's a plan here that shows what we understand to be presumed degraded areas, um, areas that do not have any topsoil right now. They're kind of bare, bare soil without much growing on them. And the uh, improved mitigation and restoration areas and the square footages for that. Um, so I'll go back to the overall site plan and um, please let me know if we have any questions or clarifications. Questions from commissioners or comments? I, there's something about um like a dry creek bed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. I can zoom in on that also. Um, so around the sort of northwest side of the house here, um, we provided an area for a dry creek bed. This would have a, um, I believe there's a detail for it on this page here, um, have about six inches of um, washed rocks as a, as a, a channel that allows infiltration, um, does not have you know, any impervious surface under here. That would allow water to um, move from um, the front yard if there's any event of flooding. Um, this would be a low point and um, have the water direct down and around towards a rain garden in the backyard. Uh, the rain garden is also counted towards uh, 9.1 cubic yards of compensatory storage that would 
uh, offset the um, required compensatory storage needs for the additional volume of the proposed work. Got it. I guess I was like looking at these plans. I guess I was a little bit surprised by the location of the creek bed. Is that like, is, is there flooding that's been happening, or is it? Can you? Is there a history of the flooding in the front yard, or? Um, there's not necessarily flooding in the front yard, but there are two gutters that kind of just currently downspout just to the front yard here. It's pretty flat, and so having um two gutters that would tie into the rain, uh, the dry creek bed would be. Um, our intent there. And there is, um, this is looking alongside the house from, from this corner. So this is looking along um, where the dry creek bed would run. And there is quite a bit of erosion right there because there's no topsoil. Um, and this is kind of another area where you can see there's not a lot of, no, really at that point, no soil at all. And so kind of directing that to be a narrow area to then allow for infiltration and having um, the soil around it amended and allow for for grass or shade plantings. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And then, sorry, just another maybe silly question, but can, why isn't there topsoil on this site? Is it because of the construction, or is it erosion, or what's sort of the history of that? It seems like a, a bit of a mix of the of the two. Um, definitely, construction has compacted things in the front garden in the front yard, um, and there's been some erosion around in the backyard. Uh, we have only been introduced to the site in the last year, um, last fall. So I don't know the precise conditions prior to that, but um, definitely compaction is a is an issue there. So um, okay. it would be a part of the um, landscape plan would be to um, decompact the entire site. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Elena, it, it looked like primarily it was the, the rear deck that was necessitating the, the need for compensatory storage since that's the bulk of what's being done within the floodplain. Can you discuss the decision to propose a raised deck rather than, than something that, that sits on the ground since both are considered alterations under the Rivers Protection Act? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the current deck, um, let's see if it shows here. The current deck is, is two different levels. Um, and so there's no no place to very comfortably put any kind of outdoor tables or chairs and, and outdoor gathering space. Um, so that's the reason for the expansion of the deck. The reason that they you didn't want to put um, a gathering space or a patio directly on the soil um, was twofold. One, we wanted to kind of keep the 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 area that people gather in above the typical flood line. Um, and so having a deck be raised and up, up above the ground does allow for that. And um, if we were to put a patio directly on the soil, um, any impervious surface um, from the patio would then be directly on the soil and not allowing any infiltration from floodwaters into that soil or through that soil. Um, so our proposed um, deck would, would allow for floodwaters to move underneath and still flow through the, through the soil below. And, and related to that, could you talk about how compensatory storage is proposed to be provided? Uh, yeah, so we calculated um, all of the lumber that will be needed to be installed for all of the steps, the risers, um, and all of the new, the new wood that will be below the 153 uh, flood line of Northampton. Um, so the compensatory storage would be uh, removed from this area here uh, which is currently uh, somewhat of a low point in the yard, but making that a little bit lower, more of a depressed area, and making that be the cubic footage that would um, compensate for that volume being added. That's what we're calling the rain guard, correct? Correct. And uh, can is that a one to one? How did you come up with the 9.1 cubic yards? The 9.1 cubic yards was kind of just a, an overshot. So the um, direct amount of compensatory storage required from the total volume of the deck, I have that down here. So the proposed volume that we would be adding is 6.2 cubic yards. Um, but the total volume of the 
um, rain garden is 9.1 cubic yards. So we wanted to make it a little bit bigger than it needed to in order to make sure that it um, both served the function that it needs to and also um, was a, a, a nice size for that area of the yard. And this, uh, compensatory storage is always one of the things that I find um, only <laughs> semi-logical. Um, that Because it's usually, we talk about uh, at each foot of elevation, any intrusion has to be, uh, any new intrusion um, has to be balanced with uh, uh, compensatory storage at the same elevation. Um, and is I, I don't, I, the topo lines are faint here, but I, is that what's happening here? I'm, I'm not clear to me what. So is, what's happening here? It is looks the, like the rain garden is just a pool to hold extra water, um, uh, and not necessarily at the same level of the new structures that are um, taking up the existing capacity. That's correct. So the um, in this case, we propose that the rain garden is at a lower elevation than the same. Um, elevation as the as a proposed work at the deck. Um, that's partly because there's very little space um, that would be possible to do that on the site. Um, this is topo line 150 right here, which also continues around and onto the front yard. Um, but it seemed illogical to us to offer compensatory storage in the front yard when um, in reality the the whenever it does flood, that flood water comes from, up from Broughton's Brook and up from the Mill River. So offering compensatory storage that would actually store some water that would be displaced by this deck um, would be continuously connected to the, the Mill River and the Broughton's Brook, whereas the front yard um, typically has not flooded in the past. And so we wanted to offer something um, that would actually um, store water uh, sooner than, than it would yeah. in the front yard. Thank you. And so what the, in one of your uh, staff report comments had to do with the kind of flood data being used. Um, is, has that been clarified here? That's one of those technical things that I usually skip over. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. one of DEP's comments. Um, and I, I'm not sure that it was addressed, although it, it may have been and just not noted. Um, so DEP had asked which vertical datum is being used. Um, because Northampton FEMA maps are based on the NGBD 29. Uh, the vertical data for the survey or for which flood line we're considering is the high, highest flood line? Uh, both. So the okay. uh, for the, the floodplain elevation and the justification for that and the, the datum being used, because we've, we've had instances in the past where sur the surveyors are using one datum and um, the the floodplain elevation is in another one. Sure. Um, the number 153.1 was uh, one that I got from you, Sarah, when I called and asked for which number was the most accurate, knowing that the FEMA maps were uh, not truly to be trusted. Um, so we did we did go with the number that you have on file. Um, and I believe we are in the same um, the same datum and a D V83. Um, I can double check that. And okay, and and this was, that was what was provided in in previous permits as well. That's correct. Yep, yeah. it's the same as pre same survey as previous permit. So uh, I walk by there pretty much every day, um, and there are huge knotweed forests basically everywhere, um, <laughs> and so you're going to be identifying and removing a couple of uh, localized areas, how are you going to keep it away? Um, cutting, cutting it, as you probably know, isn't necessarily a good idea because little fragments can become whole new plants. That's, that's right. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone can keep it away. Um, we're hoping to do our best by um, cutting it back repeatedly several times. There is a neighbor directly next door, um, slightly upstream that does have knotweed that is just off the map, but will not be controlled by our plan. Um, so inevitably encroachment will, will continue. Um, but our plan is with um, ongoing maintenance 
and replanting with native plants that are voracious growers within these conditions would hopefully at least give the knotweed a run for its money, knowing that it would be an ongoing maintenance uh, concern. Yeah. Eradication would be uh, unlikely. So that uh, uh, operation and management plan would be um, one of the conditions that we would want to see. Um, mm -hmm. And at the present time, uh, it seems like that, that plan is not uh, included in this application, uh, but we'd want to see it uh, run by and approved by Sarah before uh, construction actually begins. Understood, that's uh, absolutely possible. Other questions, comments from uh, commissioners? No. This is one of those, it's a, it's a, as I say, I walk by it most days um, down the path there, um, and it is a it's a beautiful spot, um, and it seems like the applicant is trying to do uh, make make it usable, but in a uh, environmentally friendly way, uh, which I applaud. Uh, at the same time, it's all a floodplain. I mean, you know, all the way out to the street is a, is a floodplain. So um, this is a uh, place that's pretty vulnerable. Mm. Any que other questions, comments from commissioners? No. Nope. If not, is there a motion? To oh, questions or comments from members of the public? Hi. Can you hear me? Jackie? Yes, yep. Jackie, Jackie Ballas, 35 Warner Street in Bay State. Um, I'm familiar with this property too. I, I walked by it as well. And I've seen pictures of it when the backyard was flooded up beyond the seat of an Adirondack chair. So being at the confluence of two busy waterways, uh, it's bound to flood. But this, this, I think this design is, is brilliant and beautiful. And I think it's going to be an improvement. I would also mm -hmm. like to mention very quickly that the one of the there's there's two possible reasons I can think of why there's no topsoil in this slight is because it's downhill slightly not far from the site of an old uh, paper mill the one that mm -hmm. made the paper for the first gazette like circa 1830 so I don't know if that would degrade <laughs> the land but also it's also on the bottom slope of a drumlin. I mentioned a drumlin earlier this evening and drumlins are famous for not having topsoil, uh, lots of yeah. clay, et cetera, et cetera. Sandy. Thank you. Uh, so every drumlin is different. Yeah. Other comments from members of the public? If not, um, is there a motion to close? So moved. And a second. second. All second. Made and seconded. Uh, all in favor. Sarah, roll call. All right. Roll call vote. Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Um, so there's a, uh, a, a number of conditions. Um, uh, as I say, I think this is basically an environmentally friendly and thoughtful plan. Um, and, uh, but the uh, additional conditions would be for an operating and management plan for ongoing maintenance of both the plantings and the uh, invasive spring removal. Um, and what else, uh, additional conditions beyond this? Sarah, did you have any recommendations for others? Uh, let's see. So the commission would need to include a finding that the um, all that the um, 
flood storage compensation provided um, meets the interests of the act, although it does not strictly comply with 310 CMR because it, it's not at that foot for foot if the commission finds that that's appropriate. Uh, so I see I'm looking now at your uh, be able to find the restoration includes removal of all debris, but retaining yep. any trees and other mature vegetation, grading to a topography which reduces runoff and increases infiltration, uh, coverage by topsoil at a depth consistent with natural conditions, and seeding and planting with an erosion control seed mixture followed by plantings of herbaceous and woodings species appropriate to the site. So some of that is included in this plan, um, uh, but... So if the commission um, can find that all of those things are, are done here, um, then it, it would qualify as a riverfront restoration project with the mitigation proposed. As a restoration project. Is that going to require a lot of topsoil? <laughs> you got a question for me? Well, well I'm just wondering how much topsoil would be required to uh, provide coverage of depth with natural conditions at the site. It sounds like the site is has a dearth of topsoil. At the front yard, it does, especially around the side and a little bit of the backyard. Um, the topsoil in this area is not particularly um, deep or rich. It's quite a sandy site. And so the A horizon is fairly thin on other parts of the site, um, but it is a little hard to tell because the rest, most of the rest of the site is, is grass, a lawn. And so um, perhaps not the most mm -hmm. accurate reading of um, what would be um, its natural state. Uh, but our plan would be certainly to um, apply several inches of topsoil across the front of the site, um, along the side, and at the back where it's the most degraded. Okay. But in order to uh, minimize runoff, get I'm trying to see topo lines here, but um, how, how much uh, slope toward the Mill River is there currently? Um, the most slope is closest to uh, to the deck and to the house here. There's the, the house is at one topo line and it drops down one, two. And then from here, this line is 147. From here on out, it's pretty flat until the bank drops off to the river. So this is line 147, I believe, and it loops around. This is also 147 and this is 146. So uh, the majority of the site uh, below these bottom steps here is is fairly flat. Well, that um, that seems gentle enough a slope to me um, that I'm not worried about erosive uh, runoff. Right. Does does adding topsoil impact the compensatory storage calculations? Not no, because it's so little. Is that how it works? I uh, it would. I mean, anything brought into the site uh, would would need to be calculated in but there there also is some extra as it's yeah. been shown here okay so we forget where we are have we uh closed the hearing <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, we're okay. talking about conditions we have close the hearing, and so we're it's determining the uh, the appropriate conditions. Um, uh, so I suggested uh, including the detail and ongoing O and M plan, yeah. um, both to make sure it's a, it's appropriate and and to get everybody on the same page about what's going on. So I can so nasty. Um, adding a condition prohibiting further alteration within the restoration or mitigation area, except as may be required to maintain the area in its restored or mitigated condition. Uh, and that one's not flexible. That's actually a requirement of the 310 CMR for this type of work. And then prior to requesting an, um, a certificate of compliance demonstrating that things have been successfully completed for at least two growing seasons. There would be seven. Um, I'd be inclined to say three growing seasons to be consistent with what we often do, but. Um, 
Paul, you were saying something? Just I support uh, the seven conditions, the three that Sarah just uh, mentioned and the four that um, she put in her staff report. Very which good. you read. Any other discussion? If not, uh, we have a motion and uh, to grant an order of conditions with uh, several uh, specific additional conditions in addition to the standard conditions. All in favor? Sarah, roll call. Uh, we didn't have a motion. Oh, we, we, we had a motion. Paul, ah. is that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> After a couple of hours, I get uh, uh, a little forgetful about where we are in these discussions. Yes, we need a motion to grant an order of conditions uh, with all those uh, conditions that have just been discussed. Someone want to make nope. a motion to that effect? Paul made a motion. A second? A second. Beth, second. All in favor now, Sarah. Uh, roll, roll call. call, Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. Unanimous, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, now we go back to uh, what was supposed to happen. Um, <laughs> We're only an hour off, but at at least we don't have 15, to wait, right. so that's good. A request for a determination of applicability to determine if removal of four trees within the riverfront area uh, is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance, this on Turkey Hill Road, uh, National Grid is the applicant. Who's here to present on that? Hi, Terry Reynolds. Um, here. Uh, Thanks for staying with us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I took a nap. Uh, <laughs> but uh, National Grid's uh, extending the the um, utility service to the end of Turkey Hill Road. And in order to do that, they need to take down four, well, they've taken down a number of trees along the road, but there are four pine trees right at the 200 foot riverfront limit uh, that need to be taken down that would uh, you know, be an issue with the, with the new tell with the power lines there. Um, and I can share my screen and show you what we're talking about. So here you have Turkey Hill Road it comes to the end right here. Can you all see this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's paved right up to about this driveway. And then it becomes a gravel road that goes into the conservation area parking lot that's been built. Um, and, you know, and so it, it's just a narrow, narrow gravel road at this point. And right here, they need to put a pole. And then there are uh, four small trees here. That need to be removed to accommodate that pole. Um, they're not in the greatest health. Um, I can share a picture of them um, so you can see that. Um, so these, this tree, this tree, and then these two small, small ones are ones that are proposed to be removed. Um, okay. Other than that, no others are are proposed. Um, and the telephone poles going right there in front of them. Yep. Um, huh. So um, at this point, that's what they're proposing. There are some um, dead ash trees that they'd like to remove, some of which are leaning into the road, um, which will eventually fall into the road. So they'd like to remove those. Um, and then um, let me put the others back up. Um, there is a large dead pine uh, right about here that they'd like to remove also that is gonna fall down soon. Um, so those are those are it. And you can see here's a 200 foot riverfront. So these are right at the riverfront um, line. Yeah. Questions, comments from commissioners? Are you planning to plant any replacement trees? Some could be. Um, there, there's not much opportunity 
in terms of area to plant any re replacement trees. Um, there's a stone wall here um, that is going to get disturbed. That uh, There's a lot of sucker stuff that's going to get taken out when this utility trench gets put in um, uh, along the stone wall. And some replacement trees could go right in there. We are limited. We can't go over in this area because this property owner has a uh, an easement for this entire area mm -hmm. for septic systems and, and grading. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, certainly a certain amount could be put in here. Um, I looked at it and it doesn't appear we, by the time you look at spacing, whether there's enough to completely replace uh, the same caliper in here without it being really crowded. We've looked at other areas that we could possibly do something. We have the new new water quality swale here, which I don't think we want to put trees in. And same over in here, we have a grass outfall area. Um, uh, thought was up the shoulder, but this is very dense right up to the edge. Um, yeah. there, so there really isn't a lot of opportunity areas. Uh, this area you might think might be good, but he, the the proposed development has a driveway right here. Um, so really couldn't put something there either. Terry, did you consider putting them within the, the Mineral Hills Conservation Area? Within, over in here? Yeah, and anywhere. I mean, they're, because, oh, yeah. that, because that parcel is essentially part of the overall project and this isn't an order and wouldn't create any deed restrictions, I, I'm sure the commission- Right, well, that's what I was suggesting. We could put some in behind the stone wall here. Um, so we could we could put a limited amount right along there um, because there right now there's there's a like dense sucker growth of uh, poplar and stuff all in between the rocks there and stuff. So um, those will will end up being taken out when this trench is put in. Um, so we could replace those with some replacement trees. Um, but even farther to the west beyond the the park well, over here would be yeah it would be an option too since that's well, yeah except for it's it's pretty wooded okay um i guess right in this area there there's some pines that are some dead pines that have fallen over but it's pretty shaded i don't know uh if you're going to get great benefit or even i mean we could certainly put some stuff in Okay. I mean, I think the the primary intent would be to to sort of replace that that edge transitional area uh, and not try to jam a tree in where there, there's already. Yeah, it, this seemed like the most logical area to put them. Um, you know, they'll get they'll get good light. They will grow well in there. Um, And what, what would you propose? A similar, not, not same caliper size, but uh, similar numbers and uh, species? Yeah, I would try and get as many, you know, here I had, um, you know, five, two to two and a half inch caliper trees along here. That's what uh -huh. you proposed, doing something like that. Okay. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? Uh, I'm assuming that National Grid will remove all of the tree material once they're cut. Yeah, they, they will. They've, they've actually been out there and they stopped right at the 200 foot riverfront. Um, so they've already cleared all the trees along the roadway here. This okay, point. good. Good. I don't think there are any members of the public still paying attention, but if there are, uh, anybody have a comment as a member of the public? So um, this is an RDA um, request, so we don't have to close a hearing. Um, someone want to make a uh, motion uh, to allow the removal of these trees subject to the replacement as we've just discussed. So moved. Seconded. Uh, and a second? Yep. Second by Paul. Um, any further discussion? If not, all in favor, Sarah, roll call. 
All right, Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, you know. Great. All right, and lastly, much. we have a notice of intent for wetland replication related to driveway construction in the bordering vegetated wetland and buffer zone, this on Coles Meadow Road. Who's here to present on that? Uh, Peter LaBarbera, I think, is here. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to unmute. No, I'm sorry. It was, it's been a long meeting. That's okay. I <laughs> understand. Um, and uh, with me is, is the property owner and project manager, Jerome Composio. Um, we're just in the same room. That's why he's not, you don't see him at the Zoom login. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like me to proceed, I will. Please. Oh, okay. Good evening. Um, so uh, Peter LaBarbera, Environmental Planning Associates, Jerome Camposio, um, and property owner on Coles, 367 Coles Meadow Road. Um, we're here applying to, well, we, we received uh, an amended notice of intent in the fall of 2022, um, an order of conditions in the fall of 2022, and um, uh, proceeded with the work in the spring of 2023. And um, due to weather, um, we were unable to finish in the time allotted for the expiration of the original 2019 order of conditions. And so we're here applying in this notice of intent to complete the element, complete the project that we started. Um, so what we've provided to Sarah and the commission is a colorized version of the completed work plan, which I can, uh, if you'd like, I can do screen share and and uh, walk you around that. Please. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, you can see that, I trust? Yep. Yes. Okay, so um, there are four colors here. Um, we have the throat of the driveway in gray. So I call that the traveled surface of the driveway. That's complete, doesn't need any more work. The blue adjacent to it and girdling the traveled portion of the driveway are the riprap side slopes. Um, uh -huh. of the driveway, and that's also complete, doesn't need any further attention or work. What, um, and also the th one culvert and two flow equalization devices. The, the culvert is here at, at the, near the road. The second culvert or otherwise technically called flow equalization device is here, at, not far from station two plus zero zero. And the third flow equalization device, not far from station three plus zero zero. Those are all in um, and, and completed um, to George Costa's satisfaction. And so what's what has not been completed is out here to the west, to the eastern part of the property, the the we the original plan. That the original approved plan called for a vehicle turnout. And the only reason why that's sort of not quite complete is we haven't really settled on the northeasterly curvature of the driveway. So once that northeasterly curvature is sort of fine, the house is built. Um, and so now the house is built sort of the curvature of the driveway can be finished. And so to some degree that that comes into the sort of finalization that comes into the outermost part of the 100 foot buffer zone. Consequently, I've shaded that in brown just to say that, you know, we don't know the exact curvature at that point. So that has to be done and that's, we're applying for that because it does 
uh, very small amount is in within the 100 foot buffer zone. The other, um, the other element also in Brown is the turnout that was called for in the plan, um, proximate to Coles Meadow Road, and that's here. And then immediately adjacent to the turnout is the wetland replacement area, um, which is uh, that the work, it was prepped to the extent that the trees were removed, the, the soil was disturbed in the process of removing the trees, and we were about to then establish the desired grade or elevation of that area when, when we basically ran out of time and growing season. Hence, that's proposed in this notice of intent, is to complete that. The specifications of that, the physical specifications and the planting specifications and the soil treatment all remain the same. Uh, as they were proposed in the original replacement plan. Um, I did tweak the replacement plan at Sarah's request. I, I consulted the 2022 DEP wetland replacement guidelines, which led me to tweak that replacement a little bit, mostly in nomenclature and in, the, in just sort of the emphasizing and putting an extra step in about do not use mechanical equipment in the final grading and the final deposition of topsoil and planting. So um, those that's that's the gist of it uh, there. That's what's being proposed. And so we're, we're here to answer any questions that the commission might have. Why do you need a, 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 an additional turnaround or turnout area near the entry? Uh, yes, and that, that was... Um, that was discussed in the 2022 amendment and in the 2019 original proposal. Um, that's critical from a safety standpoint because we have a 500 foot long straight throat of driveway that's only 12 feet wide. And so you, if there's an emergency situation, um, whether it be an emergency involving public safety vehicles or just an emergency involving multiple family members or visitors to the house having to access simultaneously without that turnout, it means that somebody might have to back up 500 feet um, without, without straying off of the 12 foot traveled throw to the driveway. So um, uh, that, that's why that's a critical element for safety purposes. Thank you. Got it. And I would just add too that you know due to the, the history of this one with the initial denial um, and then the um, and then the resulting permit uh, following some court proceedings, I didn't want to open up the whole book on the permit. I just we peeked in it a little bit, um, but I did ask Peter to go back and look at the updated replication guidelines, and I I think we'll you know we we may have a slightly better um, mitigation area product, but. Otherwise, it's it's basically just allowing the work to be completed that was already permitted and meet the mitigation yep. requirement that was required. Yep. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? No. Or from members of the public, if there are still any paying attention. <laughs> if not, um, there's the motion to close the hearing. I move. Yeah. Okay. I'll second. All right. We got a motion by Jen, a second by Paul. Um, all in favor, Sarah? Uh, roll call vote on that. Beth? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Um, so, seems relatively straightforward. We've already uh, permitted this yet. We're just essentially um, extending with some additional information, um, a project that we've already permitted once. And uh, as I remember, there was a much more curvy driveway. There was worry about uh, uh, 
fire trucks and all kinds of things back several years ago. So this uh, seems a little bit more straightforward now. Um, you, you permitted it three times, essentially. <laughs> so this this is the fourth. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, someone want to make a motion to grant an order of conditions? I'll make that motion. I'll second. And seconded. Uh, further discussion, any uh, additional conditions that other than uh, from the prior order? No. If not, um, motions made and seconded. All in favor, Sarah? And Beth? Yes. Paul? Jen? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Good luck. I know this has been a project for many years, so uh, hopefully it's coming to an end. All right. Thank you. Um, for helping. I'm sorry. So we're, no, we're done with that. We'll move on to, to. Sorry, Sarah. No, no. I didn't mean to interrupt, Mr. Chairman. I didn't know if there was anything further. If you were needed any further comment or conclusion on my part. No. Well, You'll you'll be getting forms from Sarah. All right, very well. Make it all official. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, sure enough. Uh, summer schedule. So I can send out a poll since we don't have everybody here, um, and we, you know, rather than trying to guess at the date of the uh, continuation, I can just re-advertise that, and that works just as well. Okay. So okay. we'll poll for that, and then based on that, we'll uh, settle on a, a, a follow-on date for the uh, solar panel project. Uh, and for newer members, we're, uh, we typically only meet once each in July and August to allow people to go on vacation, not have to worry about site visits or think about wetlands permitting. Yeah. Merciful. Um, uh, and just last few quick couple things. We do have a, a new subset of the Conservation Commission website that includes some details about the Pine Grove restoration. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, take a look at the site plan. Um, go out there if you haven't and, and see what's going on. The, the, we have some new tenants at the site. We have some busy beavers doing busy beaver things, which is exciting. That's exactly where we <laughs> want them. We hope they wouldn't go quite as far as the dam and pack it with bricks and rocks and other things that we've found there. But we, where we can, are the beavers? Uh, so where, they made where? it all the way to the irrigation impoundment and are working as hard as they can to pack that <laughs> of whatever they can find because there's not a lot of woody debris there um, to overtop the dam and, and do what they're going to do. But we, we will work with that. For um, an order of compliance. <laughs> um, and what else do I have? Um, there's a, a, an adolescent beaver in the Mill River just about a 200 yards. Uh, upstream from uh, Paradise Pond that I saw yesterday. So. Uh, That's great. Uh, you know, I, I learned from one of the um, Massachusetts uh, Conservation Commission uh, workshops that beavers have a high iron content in their teeth, which because they grow, they have to gnaw them down, but they have to go after really hard wood to wear them down because they're like steel. <laughs> You, beavers yeah, are. I, I, I told my dogs not to mess with the beaver, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a lot of freshly gnawed trees along the Mill River too in the last uh, week or two. So I, I haven't found a lodge, but uh, the beaver's taken the stick somewhere. Yep. <laughs> All right. So Sarah will send out a poll, and we'll figure out then on the basis of that when we're going to next meet for the next two months. And, but we will have a meeting uh, June 27th, and I'll be in touch about site visits for some things coming up over the summer as well. And I will check on Mason. What do we have so far scheduled on the 27th? Uh, at this point, I think we have a couple pretty quick RDAs, um, and I'm hoping to have the MOU with uh, New England Mountain Bike Association finalized by then. Oh, nice. Well, I... Uh... I, I'm on the 27th going to be, uh, it's iffy whether I can uh, zoom in. Um, I'm coming back, Paul from Lowe's Lake, uh, 
where I will have been for uh, three nights, four days of camping, uh, wilderness camping. Uh, it's a, an undeveloped lake in the Adirondacks that you have to paddle upstream eight or 10 miles just to get to the beginning of the lake. Um, and it's 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 really out there. Paul's one of Paul, Paul's favorite places. So River flow and the lower dam still has not been fixed. Right, we actually have figured out uh, permission to uh, to put in at the Boy Scout camp. Um, oh, right. uh, just be because Peter uh, Searsma, one of our uh, yeah. the three of us that does this every year, uh, back in <laughs> 1958, he helped <laughs> lay some of the foundations of uh, that Boy Scout camp. So they have given us permission to put in there. So we're actually uh, going to get through the locked gate and um, won't have to paddle those eight or 10 miles this year. Nope. Beautiful. All right. Uh, bless you, Jim. Thank you. I have to hop off, but this is all right. Well, guys. I think it's a good time to end. Sarah, thanks so much for your help. Thank you, everybody. This is a long and somewhat agonizing initial part to the meeting, but uh, we did what I think was the right, as yeah. right as we could get it. So thank you all. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. See ya.